Today we're continuing our study in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel profiles years and years of history. I love history. And for me, Daniel, just from a historical perspective, is an amazing book, but there's even more. The book of Daniel presents over 200 prophecies. And if it is found that those prophecies are true and that they have come to pass just as the prophet foretold, then the book is not only amazing, it is inspired. And I love the fact that our Bible, the Holy Scriptures are inspired. There are books that are right and good and encouraging and true, books that are historically accurate and full of wisdom, but only the Bible is inspired given to man through the Holy Spirit. God's word is just that, God's word. The book of Daniel is amazing, and the book of Daniel is inspired. The book of Daniel is a collection of history, but it's also a collection of prophecies fulfilled and yet to be. We're in Daniel chapter 11, and it's the beginning of his final vision, God's word to him about what will be in the days to come. Chapter 11 profiles a couple hundred years of history. And chapter 12 profiles the last week of history, what we call the tribulation period. So we actually stand in the midst of chapters 11 and 12. We could look back at chapter 11 and we could see that the prophecies have been fulfilled. And we could look forward to chapter 12 knowing that what God has promised and what God has said, he will be able to bring about. Today we're going to look at the prophecies that are present in chapter 11, and we're going to look at their fulfillment. Daniel is writing at about 550 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. And his prophecies are so amazing and specific that liberal scholars have said that Daniel actually did not write the book of Daniel. It's just too precise. It's just too right. So Daniel did not write it at 550 or so B.C. Someone else wrote it in Daniel's name maybe 50 to 100 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. They were not writing as a prophet who was looking forward to what might be. They were looking back in time, and they were just recording what was. And that's why Daniel chapter 11 is so amazing and so specific and so right on. But Jesus himself called Daniel a prophet Jesus himself in Matthew 24 noted the authenticity of this man and his ministry and his writing. And not only that, in the last 70 years or so, the Dead Sea Scrolls have been discovered. And amongst those holy writings was the book of Daniel. And that ancient writing, that ancient collection of the book of Daniel actually predates the date that the liberal scholars say someone in the name of Daniel wrote the book. So the historical record, the archaeological record, the fact of Jesus' validation of his ministry, it communicates to us that the book of Daniel is right and true, and as I said before, inspired. Verse 2 begins with a picture of what will happen in the Persian Empire. He says, I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise. Right now there's Cyrus, but three more kings will arise in Persia. And the fourth will be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he will stir up all against the realm of Greece. One of the reasons that the liberal scholars say that this was written at about 50 B.C. rather than 550 B.C. is the mention here of Greece. Because 550 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, there was no Greece. Of course, there was the land of Greece, but the people there did not identify themselves as the people of Greece. This was a latter term. But I think this does not prove the Bible to be in error. I think this proves the precision nature of the prophetic word of God. Daniel is writing it as if it was fact, and in time it will be fact. This is the very same thing that the prophet Isaiah does. 150 years before the Persian Empire would become strong and led by a man named Cyrus, who was the emperor at the time of Daniel's writing, 150 years before that, Isaiah wrote that the Persian Empire would grow, would be led by a great ruler. The ruler would be called of God and used of God to help the Hebrew people, and his name would be Cyrus. So Isaiah called him out and called him by name through the inspiration of God. Before it ever happened, and in the same way, Daniel here is calling out this 
Greek Empire. It happened just as Daniel said. The next three kings, first was Cyrus, and then his son Cambres, and then Guamata, and then Darius the first, or Darius the Great. It's important to make the distinction between this Darius in chapter 11 and the Darius in chapter 5, who is Darius the Mede. It's easy to get those confused. And then finally, the fourth king would be Xerxes. Now, Xerxes was kind of an interesting fellow. He's the son of Darius the Great. And Darius the Great suffered a humiliating defeat by the Greeks at a decisive battle called the Battle of Marathon. And Maybe you remember the Battle of Marathon. It kind of ended with this famous sending of messengers from the city of Marathon all the way to Athens to give them word of the battle. 26.2 miles when the Greeks instituted the early games more than 2,000 years ago. They included this race, the Marathon, in honor of this decisive battle. And even today, it's the same distance, 26.2 miles. The Greeks won that battle, even though they were outnumbered by the Persians. The Persian leader, the emperor, Darius the Great, was humiliated and swore by Zeus that he would avenge all that had happened, but he died before that could take place. And so he called his son Xerxes and made him swear that he would take out his vengeance on the Greek people. And so as soon as Xerxes came to power, he began to prepare for war, and he was serious about it. He dug canals, he built boats, he constructed storehouses, he built roads, and he began this move against Greece with a force of two million soldiers. Now, that is an unprecedented number. That's a huge number even today. An army two million strong marching hundreds of miles. It was an incredible feat. Now, just for comparison... In the Battle of Normandy, the D-Day invasion, the largest Allied military maneuver in World War II, it involved 200,000 Allied troops. 200,000. He was commanding 2 million. Maybe you remember in history the Battle of Thermopylae. Maybe you saw the movie 300. Well, this is part of this epic movement of the Persian Empire against Greece. And they ultimately won at Thermopylae, but they were humiliated there. And then they went and fought another battle, and the Persians lost there. And then they lost a decisive naval battle. And after three in a row, Xerxes said, enough is enough. And they began to retreat, and they went back to Persia. And that was the beginning of the end of the Persian Empire. And it was the beginning of the unification and the rising up of the Greek Empire. Daniel writes of this as well. He says, a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion. He will do according to his will. No one will be able to stop him. And that's exactly who Alexander the Great was. He conquered and ruled an empire that was vast. It stretched from southern Europe, North Africa to Central Asia. He conquered the world after 11 years. In fact, the historians say that in one of his latter battles, he was looking at a map with one of his generals, and he began to cry. And the general said, well, what is happening? Why are you upset? And, and he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. No one could stop him. But after 11 years, he would die. Daniel foresaw that as well. He said, and when he has arisen, literally in the fullness of time, or at the end of his reign, we would say after he's dead, his kingdom will be divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, his kids or his son, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled, for his kingdom will be uprooted even for those others besides these, led by people outside of his family. And this is what happened. In the first couple months, yes, his family tried to assume power, but it didn't work. And within a few years, Cassander, one of his generals, became the ruler over Greece. Lysimus ruled Asia Minor. Seleucus ruled the East Babylon. Persia, and Ptolemy ruled the south, which included at that point the Holy Land. In a minute, we're going to see a great division, a division between the south and the north, and they're going to become the two principal players out of the fractured empire of Greece. Daniel saw it this way, verse 5, he said, the king of the south will become strong as well as one of his princes, which is a reference to the king of the north. You shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great 
dominion. We can look forward in history and see what happened. 20 years after the death of Alexander the Great, Seleucus, who's one of the great kings, he kills Lysimachus in battle. Lysimachus is the, the leader of this middle ground, which we call the Holy Land, the buffer land between the south and the north, Egypt and Syria. So now there's only two powerful remnants of the old Greek empire, the north and the south. In verse 6, we read, after some years, this north and the south, they will become allies. And the daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north and make an alliance. But she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. Now, it is easy to kind of get confused here. It gets a little Muddy, but basically this is what happened. In 249 B.C., the king of the south, Egypt, Ptolemy II, sent his daughter, Berenice, to the king of the north. The thought was that this would stop the Second Syrian War, and then through this marriage, there would be an alliance between these two kingdoms. Neither kingdom was strong enough on their own to overthrow the other, and so the more evil king of the north, Antichus II, said, let's do it. Give me your daughter, I'll take her as my wife. Well, the problem was the king of the north was already married. But for political expediency, he thought, well, I'll just put aside my wife and my child. Leodosis was his wife. And he put her away and his son, and he took Berenice to be his wife. But soon after that, Berenice's father, the king of the south, died And so the more evil king of the north thought, well, it was no longer politically expedient for me to maintain this marriage. And so he put Berenice out, and then he went back to his first wife and said, come back in, and you could be queen. Well, she was not happy. And so in treachery, she poisoned the king of the north. So now we have a dead king of the south, a dead king of the north, and that wasn't enough. She also gave orders to have murdered Berenice, and her child. And so just as Daniel prophesied, all of the key parties died. Berenice, the daughter, and her father, and the king of the north, and her son. In verse 7, Daniel says, but from a branch of her roots, this is the Berenice, the daughter that was given in marriage, one will arise in his place to replace the dead king, who shall come with an army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and deal with them and prevail. And this is what happened. Ptolemy III, the eldest son of the dead king of the south, and the brother of Berenice, he was angry because she was murdered. So he comes to the throne and immediately invades the Seleucid Empire, which is the empire of the north. And his armies defeat the king of the north, And Seleucus II, who was the son of the evil Antichus, who was the one who kind of started this whole thing in motion, and Laodice, they're all defeated. His campaign was successful. He put to death the evil Laodice, who gave orders to kill Berenice, and he leaves a garrison in the area of the north. So the king of the south fulfills the prophecy and leaves an army in the northern area. So no one really has control of the area yet, but it looks like the south has the upper hand. Daniel says in verse 8, This man will carry the gods captive to Egypt and their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. And this is exactly what happened. During the Third Syrian War, the king of the south recovered many of the sacred articles in their culture. Some had been gone for up to 300 years, and he carries them back to Egypt. So great was this work that he becomes known among his people as the great benefactor. And just as the prophecy said, this king of the south, Ptolemy III, outlived the king of the north because the king of the north, Seleucus II, died four or five years earlier in an accident while falling off of his horse. In verse 9, Daniel writes, Also the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south. This is a military invasion, but nothing's going to happen. He'll return to his own land. I'm sure the people reading this in ancient times thought, well, how can this be? This doesn't sound right. But in 240 B.C., the king of the north, Seleucus II, did attempt to invade Egypt. 
But on the way, his fleet was wiped out by a great storm. And so he suffered a great defeat or a great loss before the battle was even enjoined, and he had to go back home in fulfillment of the prophecy. This opens the door for the rising of a great family in the north. And when I say great, I mean great in power, not great in good. This family, the family of Antichus, was very evil. Verse 10, the sons, his sons shall stir up strife, the sons of the king of the north, Assemble a great multitude of great forces, and one shall come and overwhelm and pass through, and he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. And this is what happened. The sons of Seleucus II were Seleucus III, and also Antichus III, whom he took the title the Great. They began a war against the Egyptian provinces in Asia. However, he was unsuccessful. This first king was assassinated by a member of his own staff. And so with him gone, Antichus, even though he was young, he took the throne and he begins to fight in this middle land and he takes control of much of Judea. The middle land is the land between the land of the south, the king of the south, and the king of the north. Antichus is from the north. We read in verse 11 that the king of the south will be moved with rage Why? Because the king of the north had taken some of that land of Judea. And so he's going to go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hands of his enemy. And this is what happened. In 217 B.C., Antichus III, or Antichus the Great, was defeated uh, at a place called Raphia. And even though he had the greater multitude, just as Daniel said, he had 62,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, 103 war elephants, but he did not prevail. And Antichus III had to retreat and withdraw all the way into Lebanon, which is almost all the way to the border, the old border of his kingdom. Verse 12 reads, when he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up. So when the king of the south moves away with his army, He's going to feel pride, and all that he has won will be cast down, and he will not prevail. Even though he'll overwhelm tens of thousands, it's not going to prevail. So he had taken back this middle land, but this is what happened in history. After his victory, the king of the south, Ptolemy IV, spent only three months in this middle area, the Holy Land, and then he went back to Egypt But he left one key port in the hands of the evil family of Antichus, who exploited that, and within 10 years was able to make gains and take back most of the land uh, we call the Holy Land. Verse 13 reads, For the king of the north will return and muster a multitude greater than the former, or greater than before, and so certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. So at some point, there's going to be a great advancement, and that's exactly what happened. After the king of the south died, Ptolemy IV, Antichus the Great rallied his forces once again to attack the south. This was called the Fifth Syrian War. Antichus, though, in the end, had to withdraw from Judea and Egypt, regain control of that middle ground, the Holy Land. Even though Antichus had the superior numbers, he did not prevail in this war. In verse 14, now in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south. Also, violent men of your people will exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. So there's going to be a great battle. Many are going to rise up against the king of the south. And the people, your own people, he says, the Hebrew people who want independence of the land of Judea, it's not going to happen. They're going to claim the vision. They're going to say God's in it, but they are not going to become independent Not yet. Antichus the Great ends up negotiating an alliance with some other people to raise kind of a coalition to attack the king of the south. And this includes Philip V of Macedonia. There's a plan to divide up all of the assets and the lands of the king of the south. Antichus' army inflicts a crushing defeat on the forces of the south in 199 B.C. at a place called Peneus. And so this opens the door for a great victory of the king of the north. We read in verse 15, When the king of the north shall come, he shall throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not stand. And this is what happened. In 199 B.C., the leading general of the southern forces, his name was Scopas, he fled to the port city of Sidon. 
And he thought he would be safe because it was well fortified, just like this uh, artist's conception here. But he was not. Antichus uh, the Great overwhelmed the forces, and he allowed Scopas and his troops to live, but they had to surrender all of their possessions, including their clothes. So it was a humiliating defeat. Verse 16, But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him, and he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction and power. The king of the north will be prideful. No one will stand against him. He will do his own will, and he'll stand in control of the holy land. And so with this final victory over Scopas at the port city of Sidon, Antichus the Great took the holy land. Verse 17, he shall set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom, and upright ones are going to be with him, and thus he shall do. He shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be for him. Again, kind of a muddy verse, but this is what it means. Even though the king of the north is going to be in control of the Holy Land, the southern kingdom is still going to exist. So it's not going to be enough to control some of the southern kingdom and all of that buffer area. He wants more. And so he's going to set his face to attack the south and the upright ones. His counselors are going to be with him. And he's going to strive to do it through treachery. And it's going to involve a daughter. And this is what happened. When the young king of the south, Ptolemy V, came to power, he entered into a treaty. It was a forced treaty by the evil Antichus III. This was after the Fifth Syrian War. Through this treaty, Antichus tried to exploit a weakness in the south by giving his daughter, Cleopatra I, to be the bride of the new young king of the south. She was supposed to be a spy. She was supposed to identify and exploit any weakness and filter pertinent information back to the king of the north. But it all backfired because she became a true and faithful wife to the king of the south. She never helped the king of the north. And so just as Daniel said, it would not, the plan would not prevail. It all came to pass. Verse 18, and after this, he will turn his face to the coastlands. Not being able to totally destroy the king of the south, now he's going to go a little bit north and take some of the coastland areas that are currently under the control of the new and growing Roman Empire. And he'll take many of those, but a ruler, a new ruler, shall bring the reproach against them to an end, and with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. So someone's going to stop the evil king of the north, a new and yet previously unnamed ruler, and this is what happened. In 192, Antichrist the Great ended up going to war against Rome because he had taken some of those coastal areas. Rome said no. The king of the north said yes, and so they join in battle. Antichrist has 10,000 troops. The Romans have five, but the Romans win, and they press Antichrist III into a very difficult position. He signs a peace treaty, but he promises to pay 15,000 talents of gold and to surrender his son as a prisoner in Rome. His son is Antichus IV. And so he has to go to Rome to be a prisoner as a way for Rome to control this rogue king of the north. And it works for a little while. Daniel, verse 19 of chapter 11 reads, And he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land. He'll have to go back. But he shall stumble and fall and not be found. The king of the north will die. And that's what happened. The king of the north has to pay an exorbitant amount of money to Rome. In 187 B.C., he tries to do this by plundering a temple in Babylon, and in the midst of all of that, he's murdered. His body's not found. This opens the door for the rise of Antichus IV, sometimes called Antichus Epiphanes. He's the Hitler of the Old Testament, one of the most evil men of all time. But he has an older brother, so before he could come to power, something has to happen to the older brother. And besides, remember I said that Antichus IV was held in Rome as a hostage. His successor, so says Daniel in verse 20, will send out a tax collector and maintain the royal splendor in a few years. However, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger and not in battle. How will the new king die? Well, Antichus the Great, his eldest son, was Seleucus IV. And he took over... But he was poisoned through intrigue under the plan of Antichus IV. He had his own brother killed. 
and through intrigue and bribery and manipulation, Antichus had it made so that he would be released from Rome, and in time he took power in the north. Verse 23, after the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and be strong with a small number of people. Antichus IV becomes one of the most powerful and one of the most evil rulers of his time, but he came from nowhere. He was not the oldest son. He was not in line to be king. In fact, his story kind of begins with him being a hostage in Rome. But through evil, through deceit, through bribery, through treachery, he comes to power. The king of the north sets his sights on the kingdom of the south once he gets in power. In Egypt, there's a 14-year-old Ptolemy VI running the nation. Antichus IV, the evil one, sees a vulnerable point, and so he disguises his intentions by taking a small force, a couple thousand, into the land of outer Egypt. And when they come out to, to see what's going on, he attacks and he overwhelms them. Rome is not happy. Rome is going to help push him out of that area, and that's going to lead to one of the turning points in Hebrew history, the siege of Jerusalem. Verse 28, while returning to his land, Rome pushes him back. He's angry. While returning to his land with great riches, his heart will be moved against the Holy Covenant. That's the Holy Land. And he shall do damage and then return to his own land. And that's exactly what he does. He moves against Judea, specifically Jerusalem. He commands his soldiers to kill everyone. It's very indiscriminate. He kills between 40 and 80,000 in just a few days. A similar number are pressed into slavery. He goes into the holy temple. He defiles it. He takes uh, many of the, the holy articles. This ancient relief here, the picture on the left, was found in an underground cavern under the city of Jerusalem, and it depicts this pillage, taking away the holy articles out of the, the temple. It's a time of great desecration. And in the place of the altar where the sacrifices of the Jewish people are offered up to God, they set up another altar and this is a, an artist's depiction of a monument to Zeus. The monuments to Zeus, this one was in Athens, always huge, always imposing. They did something like that in the temple of the Jews. Verse 31, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. They shall take away the daily sacrifices and put there the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is that monument to Zeus. And the opportunity to go into the temple and to offer the daily sacrifices, that is forbidden. It doesn't happen for 2,300 days, which is in fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. In the midst of all of this, Antichus IV, they desecrate the temple. Not only do they loot it, but they set up the false altar and they throw pig's blood everywhere. And it's, and it's the worst thing that they can do in the minds of the Hebrew people. They do this on the 25th day of Kislev, which is our equivalent of December. And now the Hebrew people recognize reinstituting the daily sacrifices and rededicating the temple with the Jewish holiday, the Feast of Dedication. We read of it in John chapter 10. Contemporary culture refers to that as Hanukkah. How do they overwhelm? How do they come back? How do the Jews cleanse and, and resume the process of uh, the temple sacrifices? Well, it's through God's anointing of a man named Judas Maccabee, sometimes called Maccabeus. Verse 32 says, Those who do wickedly against the covenant, this is the king of the north, shall corrupt by flattery. Initially they came in and they paid off the priest, and the priest said, Come into our area, but just don't kill us. Well, they came in and then they killed him. But the people who know their God shall be strong, it's the Hebrews, and shall carry out great exploits. And Judas Maccabee did. He carried out great exploits over a period of three years. In 167, he defeated the large army of Antichus. And then Antichus sent Asias with 40,000 infantry, 7,000 cavalry, and Judas Maccabee had 3,000 poorly trained and equipped men. But he won that battle. And then he faced an, an even larger enemy force, 60,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry. But God was in it, and God caused confusion to take place. And even though they were completely overwhelmed and even surrounded, outmatched and outgunned on every human level, God gave Judas Maccabee and his humble forces the great victory. 
the enemy was pushed out. For a time, Jerusalem became independent, free from Roman or Syrian or Egyptian control, and they cleansed the temple and reinstituted the sacrifice. In Daniel chapter 11, we see a touch of 500 years or so of history more than 100 prophecies. We've just touched on the tip of the iceberg today, and all of them have been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. So now we are at the end of chapter 11, and we look at chapter 12. Chapter 12 has not been fulfilled yet. Now, there are some arguments about this, but the majority of Bible scholars look to chapter 12 as being yet to be. I think we stand in the middle. I think we are at this point where we could look back and we could see a powerful prophetic message. So because chapter 11 can be verified to be true, we should have confidence that what we read in chapter 12 is going to come to pass as well. And I believe that that pertains to that last week of human history, that last week of years, the tribulation period, and that's what we'll look at next week. The last few verses of chapter 11 going into chapter 12 the work of the Antichrist. Daniel's message is powerful. It's accurate, it's amazing, and it is inspired. For me, it reminds me that God's always in control, that even though the the king of the south sought to destroy Jerusalem, even though the king of the north sought to destroy Jerusalem, God's plan to work through the Hebrew people to bring about the Messiah, it came to pass. And God's plan in the end, that's profiled in chapter 12, to vanquish evil once and for all, to redeem his people, to reward his people, that's all to come. So we can have confidence in the word of God. We should live lives worthy of our calling. We should be inspired and moved to be the very best that we can be because God's word is not just accurate or amazing, but it's inspired and true. Let me pray.